we look at two important circulations, the coronary and the cerebral circulation. The coronary circulation, the blood flow through the coronary arteries is 250 ml per minute, which is approximately 5% of the cardiac output. But we have to keep in mind that even though heart is a very small organ, it has a very high oxygen demand. And the reason for this very high oxygen demand is, number one, it is a hard-working organ. It is continuously contracting throughout the day. Number two, the major fuel for the heart is fatty acids and because fatty acids have to be metabolized, the oxygen demand will increase. Now, as far as the coronary circulation is concerned, we have to keep in mind that most of the blood flow occurs during diastole. During systole, when the heart contracts, it compresses the coronary blood vessels, especially on the left side of heart. The right side of heart continues to receive blood during systole and diastole, but the left side mainly receives blood during diastole, during ventricular diastole. Now, what is the effect of sympathetic stimulation on the coronary blood flow? If I increase the sympathetic discharge, this will cause a coronary vasoconstriction. And if there's a coronary vasoconstriction, there will be a decrease in the coronary blood flow which does not make sense because increased sympathetic discharge means there is increase in heart rate, increase in force of contraction of the heart. That means the oxygen demand has increased. But if the blood vessels constrict, the coronary flow will reduce. So what happens is, now because simultaneously the increase in sympathetic discharge has increased the heart rate, it has increased the force of contraction of the heart, this increases The ATP hydrolysis, ATP is being used by the heart. There is more work done by the heart. More ATP hydrolysis means an increase in the adenosine. Adenosine is a byproduct of ATP hydrolysis. And what does adenosine do to the coronary blood vessels? Adenosine causes a coronary vasodilation. So please remember the direct effect of sympathetic stimulation on the coronary blood vessels is a vasoconstriction, but indirectly because increase in metabolic activity, because of increase in ATP hydrolysis, because of increase in adenosine generation, there is a coronary vasodilation. So it's the local factors which will increase the coronary blood flow. Now, Let's have a look at the factors affecting myocardial oxygen demand. I told you that the myocardial oxygen demand is very high. Now, how much is the basal myocardial oxygen demand? What do you mean by a basal myocardial oxygen demand? This is the myocardial oxygen demand of a heart, which is alive but not beating. That means I have produced a state of cardioplegia. The heart is alive but not beating. The myocardial oxygen demand is 2 ml per minute per 100 gram of tissue. Compare it with the skeletal muscle at rest. The oxygen demand of skeletal muscle at rest is just 0 0.2 ml per minute per 100 gram of tissue. So this tells you that even if the heart is not beating, it is still needs 10 times more oxygen than skeletal muscle at rest. So the oxygen demand of a beating heart at rest requires much more oxygen and that is 9 ml per minute per 100 gram of tissue. Now let us see which are the factors which will increase the myocardial oxygen demand. The factors which increase the myocardial oxygen demand the first will be heart rate. More the heart rate, more will be the oxygen demand. 
which makes a lot of sense, right? Number two, it also depends upon the duration of systole. More the duration of systole, more will be the oxygen demand. I'm not talking about supply. Supply is a different issue, which we've already discussed. I'm talking about demand. More the duration of systole, more will be the demand. Number three, it also depends upon the intramyocardial tension. More the intramyocardial tension, more will be the oxygen demand. And intramyocardial tension is given by the Laplace's law. We've discussed that earlier. T is equal to PR by 2W. Anything which increases the intramyocardial tension, whether it's an increase in the distending pressure, increase in the radius, or a decrease in the wall thickness, this will increase the myocardial oxygen demand. The fourth factor is going to be the work done by the heart. Let us see what is the work done by the heart. Work done is stroke volume into the mean arterial pressure. If there is an increase in stroke volume, we say this is an increase in the volume work. For example, a patient of aortic regurgitation. If there is an increase in the mean arterial pressure, we say there is an increase in the pressure work. For example, in a patient of aortic stenosis. Anything which increases stroke volume increases the work done, which is called increase in volume work. If there is an increase in the mean arterial pressure, then it is known as increase in pressure work. Now, please remember that the increase in oxygen demand with increase in pressure work is more than with increase in volume work. That is why a patient of aortic stenosis has a higher oxygen demand as compared to a patient of aortic regurgitation. And that is why, or at least this is one of the reasons why angina is more common in a patient of aortic stenosis as compared to a patient of aortic regurgitation. A patient of aortic regurgitation rarely presents with angina, but angina is commonly seen in a patient of aortic stenosis. One of the reasons is this, more work done by the heart. Let's have a look at the cerebral circulation. The cerebral blood flow is 750 ml per minute and this is approximately 15% of the cardiac output. In terms of per 100 gram of tissue, this is 54 ml per minute per 100 gram of tissue. Now, a very important point and that is between a mean arterial pressure of 65 and 140 millimeters of mercury, cerebral blood flow is going to be constant and this is because of an excellent auto-regulation of blood flow. If the blood pressure falls below 65, there is something known as a CNS ischemic response. We have discussed that elsewhere in this chapter. Now, if you study this graph, like I said, between a mean arterial pressure of approximately 65 and 140 millimeters of mercury, the cerebral blood flow is constant, approximately 54 ml per minute per 100 gram of tissue. Now, there is something known as the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. So, let's try and understand that. Monroe Kelly Doctrine states that now, remember, the brain is enclosed in a bony cage, the cranium, and brain and spinal fluid are incompressible. So, therefore, the volume of blood, spinal fluid and brain in the cranium at any given point of time is relatively constant. So, this has got a very important clinical implication. That is, if there is an increase in the intracranial pressure, if there is an increase in the intracranial pressure, the cerebral blood vessels will be compressed. And this is what happens, for example, if there is an intracranial bleed, hemorrhage. There is a rise in the intracranial pressure and that starts compressing the cerebral blood vessels and decreasing cerebral blood flow. Or if there is an increase in the venous pressure, the intracranial pressure will increase. 
Let's try and understand that. Now, if you increase, see, blood flow through a vessel depends on the pressure difference between the arterial and the venous end. It depends upon the arteriovenous pressure difference. But if there is an increase in the venous pressure, the cerebral blood flow will reduce because of two reasons. Number one, the pressure gradient reduces or in other words, the effective perfusion pressure reduces. And number two, by increasing the venous pressure, you are also increasing the intracranial pressure, which is going to compress the cerebral blood vessels. The effective perfusion pressure, like I said, is directly proportional to the pressure difference between the arterial and the venous end of a blood vessel. But in the case of the brain, cerebral blood flow, the cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to the difference of the mean arterial pressure and the intracranial pressure. Rather than the venous pressure, we will take the intracranial pressure into consideration because like I said, any increase in the venous pressure will increase the intracranial pressure. So ultimately, it will be the intracranial pressure which will determine the gradient and therefore the cerebral perfusion pressure.